In this video, I'll be explaining exactly what I do to win a game of Magic the Gathering in as little as 0.5 mana. But first, we need to clear something up, because every time I post a half mana video, I get the same comments over and over asking what it means, even though I always have a whole paragraph in the description explaining it, which even starts with, if you're wondering what a half mana is, read this before commenting to ask. But maybe what you guys need isn't a paragraph, maybe you guys need an example. So, consider the card Little Girl. Not even the whole card, just consider the mana cost, which is a necessary part of casting the spell. So, how much mana does it take to cast it? Well, if you say zero, that's wrong, because then you don't have enough mana. If you say one, well it's true that Little Girl can be cast with one, but we can do a little better. We can do it in half a mana. To do that, we only spend one half of a mana we generate, and save the other half for later. Now, I know what you're thinking. A mana is a mana. You can't say it's only a half. Well, TJ Pool, hear me out. A mana actually has three parts to it. When mana is made, when mana is held, and when mana is spent. And together, this forms one complete mana. Now, usually it's the spending that's useful, because that's the only part that lets us cast spells. However, sometimes it's sufficient to just use the holding part, which allows us to buff Omnith Locus of Mana, create a whole held mana with Mon's Goblin Waiters, and bluff the opponent with the threat of more little girls. As for the making, well, there are currently no cases where that's useful or important, so don't worry about that part. Now, if we map out the required mana for this deck, it would look like this. We merely need to tap our land for white, then spend half a mana to cast a little girl, the deck's most devastating power play. So, how much mana is that total? Well, it appears to be one, and if we were casting this spell in isolation, then yeah, it would be one. But in a full game, there are other little girls that we can cast with our floating mana. So, if we take that half mana into consideration as well, then how much mana would it take? The naive answer would be two, since we're casting two spells. However, we can do better. We can actually do it in one by simply holding out the second half of the first mana to be used for the other little girl, because mana doesn't empty during the same step or phase that it was created. So, in this fashion, two little girls only cost one white mana, since the second little girl just leeches off of a previously floated mana. So, to capture this phenomenon, we call it 2.5 mana. On a single spell basis, you'd round that up to two, but in a full game, you'd round it down to one. So, in conclusion, since that mana counts in some context, but adds no additional mana in other context, we refer to it as a half mana. So, going back to the match, you can see that I start my main phase by tapping my foil Russian temple garden in floating white, as indicated in the bottom left corner. This way, I'm able to cast little girl while keeping up the possibility of casting another one down the line, and so it won't incur an additional mana. Okay, glad that's explained. Now, what am I doing in the video? Here, I'm using a trick called deck thinning, and here's how it works. You see, like most cards, land grant and summoner's pact have an effect which is just a description of what it does to affect the game. But, unlike most cards, these two have the power to get other cards out of your deck and into your hand, which means that those searched cards aren't cluttering your deck anymore. So, by strategically thinning your deck before you start using your draw spells, you make finding the cards that you need to draw, such as Little Girl, more likely. So that's what I'm doing here. Note that we can't use these deck thinning cards to find anything in our deck, just forest in the case of land grant and green creatures in the case of summoner's pack. So if your dream was to use pack to get all four little girls together for one big slumber party, I'm sorry, but it's not gonna happen. Also worth noting is that these spells will not thin your deck if they have no more applicable cards to find. That means that, since there is only one forest in the deck, the second land grant doesn't actually do anything aside from increasing the storm count, so I do have to be careful to avoid that. It's pretty weird if you've never seen it before. Anyway, I'm thinning my deck as much as I can, because next I do a trick called Comically Gratuitous Amounts of Free Card Draw, and here's how it works. On the left, I show a bird's eye view of my deck, and on the right, I show a view from the side. Now, normally players only get one draw per turn. That's because the only guaranteed draw is from the one at the beginning of your draw step. So, if you aren't in your draw step, then you can't normally draw a card. Conveniently, we're able to circumvent this restriction by playing the following cards. First, we make two mana using several of the other cards in the deck, such as Simeon Spirit Guide and Elvish Spirit Guide. This enables us to play Mana Morphos. Although it does cost two mana, it creates two mana of our choice upon resolution, 
Next, we go to draw a card, but cleverly, we filter mana such that we have at least one red mana to cast another one should we draw it. Now, we've gotten all of the card advantage that we could out of the current Manamorphos, but that's no problem, because we can just play another Manamorphos by repeating this procedure. Use the mana to play the cantrip, create the same mana as last time, draw a card, and then repeat. As simple as that. So that's what I'm doing here. Using this, we can draw up to four cards in our deck without needing to create any additional mana, making the card draw essentially free once we've made our initial investment. Alternatively, I could have played Gitaxian Probe, which lets us draw a card for zero mana, using two life instead and letting us look at our opponent's hand. Or I could have played Street Wraith, which again only costs two life and effectively only gets countered by Stifle. These last two are necessary if we want to only use 0.5 mana the entire time. Anyway, now it's time to build up some red cards, and I mean a lot of red cards. So to get those red cards, we're going to use a trick called Abusing Loopholes, and here's how it works. You probably already know that there are lots of useful red creatures in the game, which can't normally be found with Summoner's Pact. But, did you know that you can find red creatures with Pact if they're also green? In fact, the red portion of these cards has a special property called Pitch Ability. If you tutor them with Summoner's Pact in order to cast them, then you're probably not going to get your way. However, the fact that they are red means that they qualify to be pitched to free cast certain spells, just like how Forcible requires blue cards to be pitched to work. Now, you're probably wondering what I'm going to need all of these red cards for. After all, I do draw through my deck with 12 cantrips. But to answer that, we need to talk about parallel universes. And if you thought my other tangents were complicated, just you wait. Okay, so a constructed magic deck contains no fewer than 60 cards, although it can be any number higher than this so long as you can shuffle your deck in your hands unassisted. But this number is reduced by 0 to 15 when you play an actual game of magic with a subtracted number comprising the sideboard, though the main board can still have no fewer than 60 cards. In other words, a deck size can basically be any number at or above 60, but it's converted to a main board anywhere from 0 to 15 cards smaller before the game begins. Physically, that means that the playable cards always start the game in the main board, albeit with the exception of the generals in a game of EDH. So if a card came from the main board, then it was drawn or searched from the deck at some point, but if a card comes from outside of the main board, then it changes the maximum number of playable cards from the regular zones of the game. So now I ask you this. Here's the main board. So if a card is in one of the in-play zones, but did not come from the main board, can it be played? The answer is yes. As far as the game sees it, the card is, in fact, playable over here, because the game only checks whether a card can be played by whether it is in one of the playable zones. Now, up until this point, I've been glossing over a very important detail which I now need to clear up. What if I told you the number of cards that are accessible during a game isn't necessarily equal to the number of cards in the main deck? For example, here's a Charbelcher player casting Goblin Warstrike, but clearly that card is not in his main deck. That's because Charbelcher uses a card called Burning Wish, which gets a sorcery card from outside the game and adds it to your hand. This means one of two things depending on the context. In a sanctioned event, a card that's outside the game is one that's in your sideboard, in an unsanctioned event, you may choose any card from your collection. This means that, in a sanctioned event, you can get out of bounds and gain access to your sideboard, which is probably all that you need. But, unlike sideboards, collections go on forever. In an unsanctioned event, you can access cards from any of your decks, and this is what we call a parallel universe, or a PU. And this applies to every one of these decks, so there's actually a collection of potentially infinite PUs. Here's a to-scale diagram of the average Magic the Gathering collection. As you can see, the PUs come in all shapes and sizes, but I'll be taking some creative liberties and only considering the cards that are most relevant for the sake of clear visuals. Now, PUs aren't as glamorous as you might think. The little girls are all in the main board, and their being creatures means we couldn't get them anyway. Furthermore, PUs have no tokens, no emblems, no dice or coins, and not even any of those SCG Premium cards that you still haven't used yet. So really, it's pretty barren. Furthermore, we can only get sorceries with Burning Wish, so most of the cards in your collection don't really matter. In fact, there's only a handful of sorceries that do, but luckily, we can make a list of the ones that we need, though we may be searching for quite a while. So, as you just saw, you can travel to a PU if you have Burning Wish, but it's not as simple as you might think. If you have a single Burning Wish, but need more than one combo piece, then you'll need to cast another Burning Wish before you can proceed. But which combo pieces do we need? Well, the main deck already has four copies of Blazing Shoal, 
at least one of which we hopefully already positioned in our hand with our deck thinning and gratuitous amounts of free card draw. This instant lets you pitch a red card with CMC X instead of paying its mana cost, then gives target creature plus X plus zero. Of course, you're going to want to have some big red cards for this kind of effect. That's where Summoner's Pact comes in, as it gets Progenitus, a creature that happens to be both green for Pact and red for Blazing Shoal. With two of these, your little girl is lethal on her own. However, sometimes you won't be able to find two Blazing Shoals. So then, is all hope lost? Well no, because you have three copies of Fury of the Horde in your main board and one in the sideboard. This red sorcery untaps your creatures and gives you an additional combat phase for no mana, though this time you have to pitch two red cards, though they can be any two. With four copies of Burning Wish, that means that you have an effective four more Fury of the Horde than you would have otherwise been able to use. This means that you can create a lethal little girl with either two Blazing Shoals or a Blazing Shoal and a Fury of the Horde. With that said, keep in mind that even with access to stupidly high amounts of power, we don't have any improved toughness or haste, so to win on the first turn, we will need a haste enabler like Expedite in the main board or Reckless Charge in one of the PUs. Of note, thanks to Reckless Charge, you can pitch an extra Fury of the Horde to Blazing Shoals and still have enough power to be lethal given a Blazing Shoal plus Progenitus. To invalidate one of their blockers while also drawing a card, Renegade Tactics can be found with Burning Wish as well. Of course, neither of these are necessary if the opponent does nothing to interact with you nor plays any blockers on their first turn, in which case you would only need 0.5 mana for the entire game, but neither of those are reliable. For example, as you may have noticed right there, my opponent tapped his City of Ass for 1.5 blue mana in order to cast Syncope, and that's actually the reason why I've been floating half a white mana this entire time. By floating the mana, I can spend it to pay for Syncope so that my spell is not countered and my combo not dropped. Okay, so now we're closing in on the end. The final moves that I do will be to proceed to combat, declare my 10.5 power little girl as an attacker, then do it again thanks to Fury of the Horde. Okay, now don't blink. And there we go. By playing or pitching all of the cards in my hand, I achieve just enough power to deal lethal damage to my opponent. Here, I show an abridged version of the card draw, in case earlier's viewing was too choppy to follow. At the end, you can see that I do two special card draws purely to filter two mana, since I ended up needing red mana for Burning Wish. And there you have it, how to win a game of magic in 0.5 mana. Man, I did not expect this video to become 13 minutes long when I started commentating, but I guess there is just that much to explain. Hopefully, you were able to follow along with my explanations and visuals, learn something new, and had an enjoyable experience. So, thanks for watching.